I may fail, but Jesus never fails. Amen. I saw Kelly giving Ryan a, some kind of crazy look there. I don't know if that was a signal or what was going on there. But anyway, you can't lead the singing for her, huh? <laughs> All right. Romans 8, 28. Can you really claim Romans 8, 28? That's what we're going to look at. And we will go as far as the Lord will allow us to go tonight. And uh, but Romans, this has been one of my favorite studies, but this is going to be my favorite verse in this study that we have tonight. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Father, what a great verse we've just read. What a great thought, what a great revelation you have given us in your word. And Lord, tonight we pray that you'll just open up our hearts and our minds as to what your word really says tonight. We pray, dear God, that we will be teachable, that we will open up our minds, our hearts, to be receptive to your precious word tonight. And Father, I pray that you'd help me to teach, to do what you would have me to do tonight, to obey your spirit. We ask it all in Jesus' wonderful and precious name for his sake. Amen. This verse is wrongly interpreted all the time, all the time. This verse is also wrongly applied all the time. So what does it mean? We know that all, th and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It does not say that all things are good because we know that all things are not good. I have... I, I, don't, I don't know if I should say this, but God forgive me if I do. Um, I, I meet a lot of people, I, I'm, I'm talking about Christian people, that are going through, and I know some of them are going through rough times, but I know that sometimes when you ask them, how are you doing today, their, their classic answer is, I'm blessed. Well, that's true. That's true. But to go through life and to pretend that nothing's ever bad happening to you, that's not a good thing. I believe we ought to be truthful. If somebody asks you, if somebody asks you, say, how, how are you doing today? Well, you know, instead of lying and saying, I'm blessed, which I mean, you're, you're blessed, but instead of saying, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay, just say, I need some prayer. I need some prayer. I have a burden. Now, listen, how are we going to bear one another's burdens if we don't know what the burden is? And I'm not saying be nosy. I'm not saying give me some details. Come on, let me know what's going on. I get enough of that anyway. Man, when people call me with their physical ailments, I just assume they, they not tell me some of this stuff. Amen. Y'all know what I'm saying now. Don't act like you. What are you talking about? Look, look, I've heard it all. <laughs> I, I just soon not hear it. I'll just say, hey, I'm having some physical problems. You don't have to go into detail. Amen. I could write a book on some of this stuff, I'm telling you. But what this says, it, it does not say all things are good because all things are not good. The background of this verse is found in these first three words. And we know. And we know. Well, who is it that knows? Who is it that knows? The per who, I'll tell you who it is that knows. It is the people that, have, uh, that are in bondage, for one thing, in verse number 21. It is the people that groaneth and travaileth in, in pain. We know, li listen, we know that there's got to be something better than what we're going through now. We know that. It is the people that, in, in fact, in verse number 23, we've been looking at this. That's why I wanted to give you the background a little bit. It says, not only they, verse 23, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. What are we groaning about? Well, it says it right here, waiting for the adoption to wit, or that is, the redemption of our body. Now, that's what we're waiting for. But until that day comes, we're groaning. We're hurting. We have aches and pains. We're in bondage to these bodies in which we live. In verse number 26, it talks about infirmities, talks about groanings. 
And I'm just going to tell you up until we get to verse number 28, this is not a happy passage of scripture. <laughs> Let's be happy today. Let's talk about infirmities. Let's talk about groanings. Let's talk about aches and pains. Now, there's some people who really like to do that. I mean, they'll, they'll just sit down and talk to you about their aches and pains all day long if you let them. This is not a happy passage of scripture, but it is an honest look. Now, listen, it's an honest look at the life of a saved man or a saved woman who is living in a sin-cursed world. That's what this is all about. So we know. Who is it that knows? Those who are in bondage, those who have infirmities, those who groan within themselves, waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. We groan. We groan. We're blessed. Don't get me wrong, but we groan. And then all things are not good. But we know. Now let me tell you this. The world doesn't know like we know. The world doesn't know. So they turn to the bottle. The world doesn't know, so they turn to dope. So they turn to alcohol. They turn to an affair. They turn to money. You know, money will answer our problems. They turn to pleasure. They turn to suicide. You know why they do that? Because they don't know what we know. Now listen, what's the difference? What is the difference in the bodies of a saved man and a lost man? I can think of really just one difference. The body of a saved man is indwelt by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Ghost. That's the only difference. Because a saved man gets cancer. A lost man gets cancer. A saved man has aches and pains. A lost man, <clears throat> here's what I'm saying. A saved man may go to a doctor and he's living for Jesus and the doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you this, you only have six months to live. A lost man that spends his time drinking and then on dope and everything, he can, he can go to, a, look, look, he can go to a doctor, his, his blood pressure is good, his health is good and everything like that. You say, What's, why is it, what is this all about? I'm living for Jesus. I'm living for Jesus. I'm going to church. I'm reading my Bible. Here's a lost guy, my neighbor. He's out partying all the time. He's on dope. He drinks liquor. I mean, I mean he, he's immoral. Yeah, but I know what's going to happen to the, in the end. That's right. Amen. I know that, and, we, and he knows, that saved man knows this is not all there is. He knows there's a better thing coming. That lost man doesn't have a chance without Jesus. And so what's the difference? What is the difference in a saved man and a lost man on the job? A saved man, a, a, a saved man may work all, look, work hard, give eight hours a day, be honest, a lost man just steps on top of everybody and is lazy and manipulative and, and he, he gets promoted. You said that doesn't seem fair. Yeah, but we know something that that lost man don't know. Now, here's the difference. We know that there's a purpose behind all of it. A lost person doesn't know that. We know that something good is going to come out of Something bad. We know that. And so that's the background of this. Now look, there are saved people tonight and lost people tonight picking out a casket for their little child. Right now, a man is in the hospital watching his wife die of cancer, a saved man. Down the hall is a lost man watching his wife die of cancer. What's the difference? The saved family has hope. Amen. The lost family doesn't have hope. That saved man, that saved family, they have a promise. They have a bright future. Ladies and gentlemen, the sun is coming up in the morning. Amen. I'm telling you, we know. <laughs> you can call me a dummy if you want to, but I know something you don't know. And so... The background, we know. Look at Philippians, if you would, chapter number one. Philippians chapter one. You know, we sorrow, but not as others who have no hope. Right? Well, Philipp, Philippians chapter number one, look at that. Philippians one, verse number 27. Verse 27 says, 
Only let your conversation, that's your lifestyle, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation. You see, we know. <laughs> we know. And that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Now, the unsaved are going to take a look at you in your trouble. I was telling somebody the other day, that Dale Vance spent some time talking about, about his wife, Miss Rachel, went on to be with the Lord. That hurt him. I cannot, I cannot explain that. I cannot say I know how he feels. Some of you can. But you may or may not hurt to the extent that he did. But you know what? You know what? was the outcome of all of this, especially on that last night, Thursday night, I think he had over 8,000 views on our Facebook page. Now, somebody was paying attention. And I promise you, you don't get 8,000 views unless you're helping somebody with your tragedy. And so we know, this world doesn't know, but we know, we've got a hope, amen? And that hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. All things, by the way, do you know you'll win more people to Christ when things are going bad than when things are going good? You really will. All things put together is going to work for our good. The end result is always going to be good. But there is no guarantee that each step, each day is going to be good. Just the end result. Amen? just the end result. In Genesis chapter three, you don't have to turn there, but the scene is the Garden of Eden. And the Bible says that Adam and Eve knew right and wrong, but they did not know good and evil. Are you listening? They knew right, they knew wrong. But until they took that tree, they did not know good and evil. Evil is the consequence of doing wrong. Evil and wrong are not the same thing. Evil is the consequence of wrong actions and good is the consequence of right action. So that's what took place. Now, in, and here's what we have in Romans 8, 28. A right if you live right and you do right and you respond right, the end result or the consequences will be good. It may not be good because you're doing right now, but the end, end result is going to be good. Now, in Genesis 50, you don't have to turn there, but you'll remember Joseph's brothers are standing before him. They do not know that he's second in command. Finally, he reveals himself to his brothers and he says, I am your brother, Joseph. Now, you know Joseph's story. You know how they hated him. They envied him. And when he began to tell his dreams, they hated him yet even more. And they really hated his wardrobe, <laughs> that coat, many colors. And you know the story, they threw him down the pit, sold him to Ishmaelites, so forth. They, now he stands in front of his brothers and he reveals himself. And here's what he said to them. Ye meant it unto evil, but God meant it unto good. You, I'm telling you, was there good things in Joseph's life? Hardly ever. Hardly ever. But at the end, the good came out. And it will for us. It will for us. I promise you that. In Matthew chapter number five, let's go there. Matthew chapter number five. 
Matthew 5, verse number 38. Now, when we stay right, when things go wrong, the outcome or the consequences will be good. They may not be good along the way, but they will be good in the end. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 38. Ye have heard it been said, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the, at the law, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever will compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And then the next chapter, verse number 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, don't ever, don't enter into life thinking that everybody is going to treat you right now that you're saved. That's not going to happen. That has not happened to me so far, and I've been saved for a long, long time. Amen? So not only we have the beginning or the background of Romans 8, but let me give you the beneficiaries of Romans chapter 8. Now let's go back to Romans 8 here. And let's see, who is the beneficiary of this verse? Who does this verse belong to? Who can claim this verse? Well, notice what he says. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. He does not say to them that are saved. What, is it, what, what does it mean to love God? What, what does it mean to love God? Well, in John chapter 5... And here's what Jesus said about loving God. In fact, we know that we love him because he what? He first loved us. But what does it mean really to love God? And I'm going to show you something here in a minute. John chapter 5, verse number 40. John 5, verse number 40. Jesus said, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men. You see that? I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If, any, if another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Now, a man will receive Christ if he loves God. If he doesn't love God, he won't receive God's Son. I've heard people say, oh, I love God, but this Jesus part, I just don't, you don't love God. You can't separate them. First, first John chapter number four, I'll turn there for you. You can jot it down or go there if you want. First John chapter four, verse number 19. And I just mentioned this, we loved him, we loved him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar for he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Verse 21. This commandment have we from him that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. Now, in Matthew, and I'm, I'm going through a lot of scriptures tonight, but just uh, bear with me here. Matthew chapter number 22, verse number 36. Matthew 22, verse number 36. Verse 36. Master, they ask him, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus saith unto him, that's Matthew 22, verse 36. Verse 37. Jesus say, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, the crowd that sits home on Sunday because they can't get along with the preacher and they can't get along with the other people or those who really don't see no need of fellowshipping with one another cannot claim Romans 8.28. They can't do it. They can try. Listen, it's, how many of you love God? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody's raised. Now, if I ask that same question Sunday morning, which I may, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but if I ask that same question Sunday morning, I promise you, everybody on Sunday morning is going to raise their hand. I'll say out there, how many of you love God? Raise your hand. You may have a couple that, you know, but most people are going to raise their hand. Now listen, it's easy to say that you love God. You don't see Him. And you don't interact with Him. And you say, now wait a minute, preacher, what are you talking about? Now think about this. Do you know why people cannot get along with the brethren? Because they interact with the brethren. Do you know if I would say, boy, everybody, how many of you just love everybody in the church? You'd say, I, you know, I love everybody in the church. Well, go have dinner with them for a couple of times. And see how they act. And they may see how you act. See how they function at a restaurant. See how they function out in public. And you might kind of, mm, man, I don't know. I don't know if I really like this guy or not. You know why people say they love God, but they stay at home, and don't read his word, don't come to church, don't give, don't, don't witness for him? It's because they're not interacting with him. Because if they interact with God, then, then, then they're going to have to get into the Bible. And the Bible says, not the forsaking of the assembling of yourselves together. And the Bible says, Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And you're going to find out that in the Bible, God says this, 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 and this, and don't do this, 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 and this. And you'll start to think, well, you know, I said I love God, but man, it's kind of getting tough to love God. So if you don't interact with God and don't have anything to do with God, then you, it ain't going to bother you to stay home. But when you start interacting like you would with each other, <laughs> you invite me out to supper. I come over to your house. And man, I'm just the sloppiest guy you've ever seen. I spill, look, look, I spill food all over my shirt. I embarrass you in public. I'm, a, I'm a, a, obnoxious to the waitress or to the waiter. I'm demanding. I look at my bill and say, hey, you charged me too much here. You're not going to invite me out to lunch again. Are you? Amen. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> look, I, I, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying you get to learn to know people by interacting with them. And man, when you interact with people and you find out there's something that you really don't like about them, you know, what the, you know what you need to do? Is you to ask God, God help me to love that person. Because you said that you have shed the love of God in my heart. And God, I'm having a rough time trying to love this person. Forgive me. It's not the person, it's me. I'm having trouble loving that person. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know if it does or not. But the reason, the, the way that you get to learn to love people is you're interacting with people. I'm telling you, there are people that will push your buttons. <laughs> they are. There are people that's, I mean, we're all like that. Every single one of us. But you know what we go, you know what's going to, we're going to go to heaven and spend an eternity together in heaven. We better do a whole lot of practicing down here. <laughs> now I know God's going to change all, all of us. That's why he says, 
that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, <laughs> gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance, and so forth. I'm telling you what, if we did not have the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us, we'd run everybody off. And so God's saying, <laughs> if you spend as much time with God, God is saying, if you spend as much time with me as you do with your brethren, maybe you'd love me a little bit more. Well, if the Holy Spirit is in control of your life and my life, I'm going to do right because I love the brethren. If I don't love the brethren, there's something wrong with me. There's not necessarily anything wrong with the brethren. But there's something wrong with me because God says that I am to love my brother and sister in Christ. If they are obnoxious, if they don't do like we wish, if they push our buttons. There's a fellowship that we all have. But sometimes there is a strained fellowship. Amen. There really is. Now, look, tonight I'm just being real. I'm just being honest. You say, well, preacher, I can't believe you're talking that way. I can't believe you're, look, you're like that. I'm like that. Everybody's like that. I've embarrassed people. You've embarrassed people out in public. I, I know of a preacher, and I probably told you this before. I know of a preacher took the church group out to eat. They were so rude and, and obnoxious and mean and hateful and mean-spirited to that waitress or that server. And then they left a track with a little dollar tip. He went behind, all, after they left, he went behind and took money out of his own pocket and laid it on each of the table. You said, Christians are like that? They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. If they are, don't give a track from this church. <laughs> give it from the Lutheran church or somewhere, <laughs> just not from this church. All right. Once you become a Christian, it's not, do I have to do this? When you get saved, you find yourself drawn to other believers. You want to love them. We should love them. There's two types of people. I'll close. Two types of people that claim Romans 8, 28. Two types that claim that. Now, the first is those who saved. They're, they're, they say this, I'm saved by grace. And not of works, I am eternally secure. I don't have to do this, and I don't have to do that. And they don't. Because they're going to heaven, I got eternal security, so I know. And they don't do it. But here's the other group that claims this verse. I love God, they say, and I can prove it. I don't smoke, and I don't drink, and I don't go dancing, and I don't play cards, and I, don't, and I tithe, and I dress right, and uh, I, watch, I don't watch TV. Listen, neither of these two groups can claim Romans 8.28. They can't do it. A Romans 8.28 Christian is going to find out what God's will is for their life. And they are going to find out if they can get closer to God. And usually the way they get closer to God is through trials and troubles and infirmities. They will gladly yield to him, not because it's their duty, but because they love God. Because they love God. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And it's not going to be what you do or what you've done or what you're going to do that's going to get you closer to God. These trials and these troubles and these tribulations, they are meant, they are there for you to know that it may not be good right now, but it's all things are going to work together for good to them that love the Lord. All things are not good. Life is not good. People say, boy, I just can't wait to election year. Yeah. You're going to get a good government once again, huh? Are you kidding me? Listen, we've got reprobates. 
We've got whoremongers, we've got adulterers, fornicators, money hungry politicians, and you think it's going to turn out to be good? It never has. But I'll tell you what will turn out to be good. You just maintain your Christian life and your Christian integrity, and when it's all over with, Amen. it's going to work out for your good. Amen. Amen. Father, we ask, dear God, that you'll help us. Lord, help us to love one another like we should. Help us, dear God, to love you. And we realize, Father, that when you looked down and saw how wicked, how ungodly this old world is, and yet you sent your son to die on a cruel, rugged cross for people like that, for people like me. I want to thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I deserve to go to hell tonight, but because of your love and your mercy and your grace, I just want to thank you for salvation. Father, if there's one here tonight that's having a problem loving the brethren, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll just deal with our hearts. Help us to realize, Lord, that we've got something inside of us. In fact, we've got a person inside of us who enables us to love even our enemies. I pray that you'll help us, Lord, in our Christian walk and our Christian life. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake we pray. Amen. Complete in thee, no work of mine could take, dear Lord, the place of thine. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me. And I shall stand complete in thee, yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and glorified I too shall be complete in thee, no more shall sin. Thy grace hath conquered reign within. Thy blood shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and glorified I too shall be complete in thee each one supplied and no good thing to me denied since thou my portion Lord will be I ask no more complete in thee yea justified O blessed thought and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen will I be, at thy right hand complete in thee yea justified O blessed thought and sanctified salvation wrought thy blood hath pardoned bought for me and glorified i too shall be